Plotkin, Dr. Mark Plotkin of the Amazon Conservation Team. I'd like to welcome you to this Facebook Live event. We have a very special treat in store for you today. But before we get into our special guest of honor, I want to say hello to everyone. Thank you for tuning in and to ask where everybody's tuning in from. The last time we did an event like this, we got a huge audience in Colombia and Mexico, which is a very pleasant surprise. So please go to the chat box and tell us where you're dialing in from. And also in the course of the hour, you can uh, put in questions for uh, Dr. McKenna. Oops, I gave away the name of our surprise guest and for me. So we look forward to hearing from you. We want to make this an ongoing interactive discussion rather than a lecture. Uh, I want to tell you that on May 11, we're premiering season three of Plants of the Gods. That will start with peyote, two special episodes, and it will include everything from Richard Schulte's to The Who, to The Doors, to The Beatles. So we're going to cover a lot of ground. Um, our special guest today is Dr. Dennis McKenna. We're very lucky to have him. Dennis is probably the most multi-talented person in the field of ethnobotany slash ethnopharmacology. He is a chemist, a field biologist, an academician, an author, a conservationist, and a philosopher. Probably a few other things that I forgot to add, but uh, I know some of you know and adore Dennis already, and if you don't, you will by the end of this session. So thank you for joining us, Dennis. Well, thank you so much, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Is my audio okay? I hear you loud and clear. Okay. Well, yes, I've been looking forward to this for uh, quite a while. So uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Well, we have a special guest. We have a special cake, and it's called ESPD55, and that's what I want to focus on today. Mm -hmm. Dennis is the organizer, and we'll be speaking there. Uh, everybody's homework is to go to the website ESPD55 and check out the all-star lineup of people that are speaking there. But I think a good way to launch this uh, discussion is to ask Dennis about the origin, about the first ESPD, and then bring us up to the current day. Right. Well, thank you, Mark. Yes, the ESPD, uh, the first ESPD happened in 1967, and it was a private conference held, held in San Francisco under the sponsorship of the National Institute of Mental Health. And some of the leading lights of the field, there weren't that many at that time, but they were there. One of the principal organizers, not surprisingly, was Richard Schultes who is both a mentor and a, and a kind of a hero for both Mark and me. And he, he instigated this. It was a private conference. The only thing that the taxpayers ever got for their money was the symposium proceedings, which the uh, US government printing office offered for years as USPS publication number 1645. And somehow or other, that book came into my hands at the age of 18. It was published, uh, I guess, 17. It was published about a year after the conference, and somehow I got my hands on it. And it was an inspiration to me because it made me understand that there was both the ethnographic side of psychoactive drugs, which, of course, is very important, but also another aspect of it, which is the botanical side, the chemistry, the pharmacology. In other words, what is more or less encompassed under the rubric of ethnopharmacology. And uh, at the time, I thought, you know, gee, this is a real discipline. There are real people working on this. 
maybe I could be one of them someday. And, you know, in my 17 year old teenage brain, I have to admit there was an element of, wow, maybe I could get paid to get stoned, <laughs> you know, but it was a little more serious than that. And I, I did, that was a big uh, influence in, in choosing my career direction. And when they originally staged this conference, they were supposed to have follow-ups about every 10 years or so. The war on drugs came along and the government would just as soon forget that they ever sponsored anything like this. So 50 years went by and 2017 came along and I had wanted to do a follow-up since the government wasn't stepping up for a long time. In 2017, the opportunity came up. We had a venue, we had speakers, everything. We had some modest amount of funding. So we did ESPD 50 uh, in the UK at this place called Turingham Hall. And Mark was there. He was one of the keynote speakers. And I'm happy to say he's going to be also a keynote speaker for this one. So it was a great conference. We published, what we actually ended up doing was we published the original 1967 proceedings because it was public, published domain, public domain, and the 2017 symposium volume as a collector's edition level box set, which Synergetic Press put out. That's still available, that's sold well. And so in keeping with the spirit that ethnopharmacology is a dynamic discipline and things were happening. We're doing the five-year follow-up. We're trying to be true to that idea that this needs to have regular updates. So I'm very happy that, uh, uh, you know, we found the resources to do this again in the UK. Uh, Mark is going to be a speaker and we have a rather amazing lineup of uh, additional speakers, which we may get into in this in this conversation but that's the genesis of ESPD 55 the third historic conference in this series well Dennis there's a lot of irony in there especially delicious uh, worth unpacking one is that the U.S. government was sponsoring a conference on psychedelic drugs it's 1967 it's San Francisco it's known for the summer of love but right. here in political correctness, we would never have a conference of white guys in coats and ties. Uh, and I think there was maybe one or two women like Siri Van, Van Rees there, but it was just all white guys giving this talk. So that's kind of fun to look back at. Another yeah. uh, ironic piece that you touched on, you did a wonderful interview with Tim Ferriss, our friend Tim Ferriss, not too long ago. And yes. you talked about the two books that inspired you uh, on the path were uh, ESPD, and Carlos Castaneda. So That's one right. is hardcore science and the other is a fable. And that mix right. of the two, I think, is just something worth celebrating. Yes. So I didn't know at the time, a lot of people did not know that what Castaneda wrote about was mostly stuff that he made up. You know, I think that there's some, you know, loose basis in ethnography there, but he basically, I think, the consensus among the community is that he just made a lot of this stuff up, which I didn't know that at the time, and it didn't really matter. I mean, he was an inspiring writer, and what it made clear to me was that there was this other page, this other facet of this discipline, which is the ethnographic part. So you put those together with the botany and the chemistry and the pharmacology, and you've got ethnopharmacology. So, uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, uh, you know, it, it was kind of ironic that these two books, one of which was, as you say, a fairy tale was my main inspiration. But the ESPD volume, uh, you know, had just, just a lot of impact for me. And, uh, uh, you know, one of the two books that really set my career in the direction that it went. One of the things I'd like you to highlight, Dennis, is, you know, after ESPD, you had ESPD 50 that you organized. And right. I want you to walk through uh, for our listeners the new finds since then, showing that, you know, 
uh, ethnopharmacology is, is not a dead science. The fact that we have magic frogs, the fact that you have Kratom, uh, all the interest in ayahuasca admixtures going back to your PhD research. So talk about how this science is evolving on, on almost a daily basis at this point. Well, it, it is. It's, it's a very dynamic science and discoveries are still being made. And I don't uh, want to give the impression that ESPD 55 covers everything that's happened in the, in the last five years. Excuse me although things happen, have happened in the last five years. But before that, we weren't able to look at all the areas of interest. So we're, we're now looking into some of the areas that we weren't able to do for ESP50 and some of, the, some of the same things. For example, Kratom, you mentioned Dr. Christopher McCurdy, uh, who's a medicinal chemist, has been investigating Kratom and he gave a, a, a talk at ESPD 50 that was absolutely amazing. He's coming back to this one and he's going to talk. He, in the meantime, he's been able to do some clinical studies with Kratom, which not had not been done at the time. So he'll be talking about that. And I'm, I'm interested to see what findings he has. Kratom, I don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole with it, but it's potentially a solution to the opiate crisis, you know, and I, I guess we'll leave it at there. It's, it's a non-addictive, believe it or not, substitute for opium that's quite effective as an analgesic. So that's one thing we'll be talking about. A couple of areas that we didn't address at uh, ESPD50 was kind of looking at other parts of the biome for uh, you know, for new psychoactive substances that, that are usually overlooked, for instance, the marine environment. Uh, we have a marine biologist who is talking this time about various sponges that he's been working on, some of which make tryptamine derivatives like DMT, except they're brominated, they are psychoactive. And he's also been doing some interesting precursor studies. It seems that these sponges are chemical factories and they will make interesting compounds depending on what you feed them. So you feed them the right precursors and they come up with what you might call unnatural natural products made by nature, but never before synthesized in nature. So he's going to talk about that. Uh, Mark is going to talk about, well, you can tell him what you're going to talk about, but more classic approach to Amazonian ethnopharmacology, uh, and we've we've kind of expanded our scope of of interest. For example, we have a policy forum on the you know so it's not really about drug discovery per se, but it's a policy forum about the current regulatory environment around psychedelics on the international level. And Dr. David Nutt from uh, University College London is going to present on that. He's also going to talk about some of his uh, his uh, work on psilocybin. Uh, we have in that same forum, Carrie Turnbull, who is the uh, uh, president of the Hefter Research Institute, which I've been a board member of for you know 30 years or something. I can't even remember. But he's founded a foundation called The Right to Operate. And it's about protecting access to psychedelic research and kind of, kind of uh, standing up against more predatory corporate entities that basically want to patent everything. Uh, we don't think this is the right approach, you know, because these things have been known for many years, and essentially they're the, they're the heritage of all humanity. So corporate predators that want to take it and make you know, and patent it without any reciprocity. And Carrie is going to talk about that. We have a special forum also on coca, uh, destigmatizing coca. And uh, we've got it, people coming in virtually to that, one of whom is Dr. Andrew Weil, who is, who is actually at the 1967 conference. So... 66, 50 years later, and Andy is still in great shape 
and still very active in this. So he's going to be coming in with a virtual talk. Uh, we have uh, Wade Davis is going to be there to talk in person. Uh, Manolo Torres, Dr. Manuel Torres, is going to talk about the kind of the archaeological aspects of coca. And we recently uh, made a connection to a, a remarkable Peruvian woman who is uh, indigenous. Both of her grandmothers were indigenous healers in, in Peru. Uh, and she is as well, but she's also a medical doctor and a PhD. And she's in a Harvard uh, medical program. And she's been developing some, some medicines from coca that have nothing to do with cocaine. This is the thing. The, the preoccupation with cocaine being in coca has completely sort of distorted the picture. Coca is a, in the leaf form, in the less purified form, is a beneficial medicine and food. And it needs to be destigmatized because the people that grow it, you know, who uh, basically their situation up to now has been they have to grow it for the cartels because if they don't, they'll just be slaughtered. But they don't like that. And now that things have changed in Colombia, it's a possibility to, you know, maybe make coca respectable again and provide some economic uh, uh, benefits. Uh, what else, Mark? You've looked at the, at the program. We have some people, uh, two people from ICERS, which is uh, uh, ICERS, the, the Institute, what is it? ICERS, International Center for Ethnobotanical Education, Research and Service, uh, an organization that I admire very much. I think Mark probably feels the same way. They're concerned with the sustainability and preservation, particularly of ayahuasca and iboga, both of which are uh, in danger because of over harvesting and overuse. So they're going to talk about the impact on these on these plants and the traditional, you know, the indigenous communities that depend on them, how does that look in the global world when everyone is looking to ayahuasca, you know, every, for example, or iboga, not quite as much, but they're becoming too popular and mm -hmm. there's a lot of pressure on these communities. So we're going to talk about that. We also have another forum for young investigators, emerging investigators, we call them, to talk about their projects. We're trying to encourage and make clear the importance of ethnobotany, ethnopharmacology in the academic space. You know, uh, one of our uh, conference organizers and also presenter uh, at the conference is Dr. Michael Coe, uh, and he just completed his PhD at the University of Hawaii. He did his work on cultural keystone species in the area around Pucallpa and Iquitos, and mm -hmm. major cultural keystone species is, of course, ayahuasca. And, uh, you know, he did uh, an incredible job with his PhD. I was on his committee, and... Uh, and he's going to talk about that. But sadly, he will be the last ethnobotany student at the University of Hawaii because they've discontinued the program. And this is just the wrong idea. They should be expanding these programs. So we're going to have a forum about that. Okay, the conference will inspire some new startups in the academic world. But one thing yes. I want to touch on that you mentioned, Dennis, was the idea of different uses in different contexts. And Iboga, which was not mentioned at the first conference, which loomed large in the second one, uh, for Plants of the Gods, the upcoming season, I interviewed Hamilton Morris. And Hamilton Morris is the one who pointed out that Iboga is proving useful for the treatment of addiction, addictions mm -hmm. that didn't exist in the traditional cultural context. Nobody was addicted to opiates in Nigeria 50 years ago. That's so right. that new uses. And when I talked to Charlie Nichols at the LSU Medical Center, my hometown in New Orleans, He's looking at tiny doses of hallucinogens for the treatment of asthma. In other words, it doesn't make you hallucinate, but it opens the airways. Mm -hmm. So these are biodynamic principles, which may have very different uses outside of their traditional uses, but have major impact on our therapeutic practices here in the Western world. 
Right, that's quite true. I'm somewhat familiar with uh, Chuck Nichols, not to be confused with Dave Nichols, who is well, also an icon, who's the father of Chuck Nichols. But but uh, Charlie Nichols has been doing some amazing work on tiny, very almost femtomolar doses of some of these hallucinogenic or psychedelic amphetamines. They are incredible anti-inflammatory compounds and many as it turns out many of these things have this property at, yeah. at doses that are way below uh any kind of detectable psychoactive dose yes i think they call it microdosing, dennis <laughs> okay uh, maybe uh, so Antonio <laughs> wants to say something. microdosing is a we may talk about that microdosing <laughs> is a little different but yes <laughs> but i think the point you make by mark you know, is really you know, important you, you don't know what activity you're going to find in these molecules, you know, and most molecules have multiple activities. So, uh, you know, the focus uh, with psychedelics has been on the psychedelics, but what else are they doing? How do they affect the immune system, for example? How do they affect inflammatory processes? All of these are unanswered questions, and that's why this field is more important than ever. Agreed. Antonio? Yeah. No, thank you, Dr. McKenna and Dr. Plotkin. Um, no, lots of interesting stuff just listening in. Um, I was going to ask you both if you could give another brief introduction to the event. We had a couple of technical difficulties um, launching off right here. So there's so much interesting stuff, that, but we missed a little bit of our intro. So if you guys could I'll say a little bit. Uh, I'll yeah. start. I'm yeah. Dr. Mark Plotkin, Mark Plotkin of the Amazon Conservation Team. I'm an ethnobotanist focusing on Amazonia for much of the past four decades. Our special guest here on Facebook Live is Dr. Dennis McKenna, ethnobotanist, ethnopharmacologist, chemist, field researcher, academician, uh, author, philosopher. And something very unique about Dennis is he's done important work with flowering plants, what we know as angiosperms, and fungi, what we know as mushrooms. So, Dennis, could you tell us how you came to write this under the radar mushroom growers guide and how that helped launch the psychedelic renaissance? Well, that's quite a tale, Mark. I uh, and, and I don't know that I should take all the credit for that. But, you know, my brother and I went to uh, South America in 1971 uh, and that legendary part of the mostly mythical actually tale has been bandied about very much so i won't go into it but long story short we brought we we found a bunch of mushrooms <laughs> at la Chirera when we were looking for another hallucinogen uh, we actually called them hallucinogens in those days i think that term is is uh, not so current anymore but what we found was mushrooms and we had some rather profound encounters with it. Well, we brought back spores from that expedition and we wanted to grow them, you know, so that we had access to these amazing states of consciousness that they could trigger. And we messed around for a couple of years trying to figure out how to grow them. And I stumbled on a very simple method, finally published in Mycologia, a method for growing regular button button mushrooms, agaricus bisporus, on sterilized rye grain in mason jars. So I had the spores, so I and I had access to facilities and I gave it a shot and it worked. And it worked rather spectacularly. So uh, my brother and I decided to write this little book called uh, Psilocybin Magic Mushroom Growers Guide. And uh, it was no more than a pamphlet, really, but it was uh, it was a simple method for doing this that basically any any intelligent tenth grader could go to the grocery store, get the supplies that they need, and set up a closet in their in their bedroom or basement and grow small amounts of these things, or if they had space, they could grow large amounts. It, it wasn't the I mean, there are much easier methods now, but it worked reliably. And that's really what made we publish this little book. And that's what made mushrooms accessible to a lot of people, because there are a lot of, <laughs> I guess, what you might call, in, you know, curious 10th graders, 
mucking around in their parents' basement, and their parents are not paying much attention. And this this whole thing has kind of the character of a science fair project, you know. So you could slip it under the radar as as, as you know Johnny's working on his science fair project for next semester. Oh, isn't that jump wonderful? He's growing mushrooms. Sure. <laughs> we'll not talk about it. which mushrooms. Coining a new term, Big Dennis Fungal Curious. What's that? Are you coining a new term, Fungal Curious? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I want to ask you, we are using the term in the Plants of the Gods podcast, Ideogen, in that these substances are known to cause hallucinations. These substances are known to generate the God within, hence the name entheogens, but we don't see a, a, a proper term for how they generate creativity, how they generate ideas. And I think that's a much overlooked benefit of altered states, whether it's a good bottle of wine or whether it's a good batch of mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Now, we do not promote these altered states of mind as something that everybody should seek and do all the time. It scares the you know what out of me. They can people buy ayahuasca on the internet and figure they can do it at home. But at the same time, I wonder why uh, these mind-altering substances seem to be getting short shrift in terms of different mindsets, new ideas. I mean, we all know the story of Curry Ma Kerry Mullison uh, taking LSD and then coming up with uh, the polymerase chain reaction. So can mm -hmm. you address a bit in terms of how these new states of mind may generate new positive ideas in the process? Well, Mark, uh, this I mean, did, were you asked to plant this topic? Because it's very interesting that, that you should mention this, because we do, in fact, another one of our keynote speakers is Dr. Bruce Damer, who is uh, not an ethnobiologist. He's actually an exobiologist. He's a person who studies uh, the origins of life. And he is uh, and he has come up with some revolutionary ideas about the origins of life and how that happens so he's he really studies you know literally stuff that's way out there he's a space biologist but he uh is talking about how exactly this topic how mushrooms or psychedelics in general but particularly mushrooms can be catalysts for the ideas that lead to revolutionary discoveries like carrie mullis's discovery uh you know uh i i think you know, uh, Crick, the one of the discoverers of DNA, finally on his deathbed admitted that LSD was an inspiration for his visualization of the of the double helix, along with uh, uh, Winifred Watson and and uh, the other guy Watson, uh, and um, and even Steve Jobs, you know, had a had a vision of a future, and that was stimulated by LSD. So, the potential of psychedelics for not drug discovery, but scientific discovery. Effectively, these things can be lenses for looking at nature in a way that you've never looked at it before. You know, and from that you can gain insights about natural processes and how they operate. So they are tools for, you know, they're scientific instruments or they can be used that way, just in the same way that a microscope or a telescope can extend a person's senses, can interface with nature and give you the means to, if you will, dialogue with nature in ways that you couldn't do before. So I think I, I'm totally in agreement with you, Mark, that these things could be, uh, uh, you, you know, important tools for, for scientific research. Okay, well, Antonio is joining us with a question, but I want to okay. remind you that all this will be covered in depth at the conference the third week of May, ESP55.com. So if you're intrigued by anything you're hearing, and I'm intrigued by a lot of it myself, uh, remember to register for the conference. It'll be available online, and uh, we will see you in cyberspace then. But let's continue with our conversation. Antonio, you're joining us with a question for Dr. Oh, absolutely. Hi, everyone. I'm Antonio um, with the Amazon Conservation Team. Uh, thank you, Dr. McKenna and Dr. Plotkin. So this is a perfect segue after um, talking about the ESPD. 
Um, so this is a question for, for both of you, um, but since 55 years since the original ESPD, um, what would you say are some of the most significant developments concerning the use of psychoactive agents in plants since? Dennis? Well, uh, uh, you know, uh, apart from the, the scientific side of which, you know, there have been significant discoveries, you know, in, in that arena, and there is, has been progress. For example, a, a good example of that is salvia divinorum, you know, which is the hallucinogenic psychotropic Mexican mint. You know, long tradition of ethnographic use among the Mazatec and others for a long time, its chemistry was a complete mystery. And finally, that got investigated and then salvinorin A was was discovered. And it turns out salvinorin A is a, just a very interesting compound for a number of reasons. The, you know, it's, it's not strictly a psychedelic, it's a kappa opiate agonist but is the most selective kappa opiate agonist yet discovered. And it's a natural product, which is amazing. You know, if, if the Brian Roth, the person that, uh, that, that elucidated all this pharmacology with Salvador and A told me, if I had set out to design a kappa opiate agonist using software and, and drug design technology, it would not look like Salvador and A. And yet it is completely selective at, for the kappa opiate receptors and only that receptor. So it's a good example of a new compound that nature brings forth or that we discover that opens up a whole new world of novel mechanisms. We don't know what the therapeutic use of applications of something like that might be, but that's an area to be investigated. So that's one idea. The other thing is, is on the regulatory and societal front, psychedelics have gone from being prohibited and banned and vilified and hated and denounced and all of these things that grew out of the 60s. And, and you know, LSD grew out of the social turmoil of the 60s, got a lot of people upset, and there was a huge background to backlash to suppress these things. 40 years on, they're now being hailed as the holy grail of mental health care. You know, pretty amazing transformation, really. You know, and they may not be the holy grail, but I think that, uh, that they have more promise than anything right now that's in the, uh, in the psychiatrist medicine kit, you know. So it's about time. I mean, and, and the interesting thing is, shamans have known this for years traditional healers have been doing this for years medical establishment is very slow to catch up but they're finally waking up to the fact that yes these things can be used to treat kind of the mental illnesses of our time you know depression trauma addiction those kinds of things which seem to be very widespread these medicines can not simply treat them like antidepressants and conventional psychopharmaceuticals, which are basically band-aids, you know, they don't get to the root of their problem. Psychedelics give people the tools under the right guidance. It's always important to use them, you know, under the right circumstances, whether that's shamanic, ceremonial, or medical, but it's kind of for these therapeutic uses, it's definitely a do not try this at home or if you do, pay attention to your set and setting. But these these tools actually give uh, therapists a means to really cure these conditions. You know, get to the root of the problem and and get a, get rid of them. You know, actually, so so that's pretty amazing that suddenly these ancient medicines, which have been around for centuries maybe much longer than that in the case of something like mushrooms uh you know suddenly now science is waking up to their potential took long enough but i'm glad to see that it's happening 
Yeah, let me jump in there with that same question. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, the first ESPD was held in 1967. Two years later, the late photojournalist Lauren McIntyre discovered, discovered magic <laughs> frogs on the Peru-Brazil border. Nobody knew there were magic frogs. Not too long after that, uh, a couple of fellows discovered magic frogs in the Sonoran Desert. And the hallucinations from both of these animals are very, very different. So mm -hmm. that now we know the frogs are hallucinogenic, some of them, um, which at the time people would have laughed at you if you suggested this, just like they would have laughed if you have said there's a hallucinogenic mint. So it shows how much is out there. I mean, what we're trying to do with the Amazon conservation team is help protect both biology and culture. Because Dennis knows from his work in Peru, you can't just protect the plants and you can't just protect the culture. It's a biocultural approach. And I'll be talking more about that at ESPD 55, um, which I hope everybody will, will tune in for. But just to show you how difficult it is to keep abreast of this stuff, I'm working on my talk on the origins of ayahuasca in the Sipendoy Valley of Colombia, where our mentor Richard Schultes discovered it. And just two weeks ago, an article came out saying they found ayahuasca and Inca mummies. So, mm -hmm. with Schultes in the Amazon. Um, every week, if not every month, if not every day, there's another story about mind altering substances, psychedelics, hallucinogens, entheogens, uh, revolutionizing medicine, culture, industry. Uh, it's hard to keep abreast of it. And yep. so it's, it's the best of time and the worst of time. Everybody, like Dennis said, is realizing the value, but it creates all sorts of problems, particularly stress on plants like peyote or, or frogs like the Sonoran Desert Toad. Can you address that, Dennis? Well, yes. I mean, this this is one of the one of the conundrums here is these plants become more acceptable, and uh, you know, and, and as interest grows, then people. And here I think we can lay a lot of the blame, in a way, on Carlos Castaneda in a certain way. If you go back, you know, Carlos Castaneda came out with the teachings of Don Juan, and it was an inspiration. I was inspired. You, I mean, even though I, and I didn't know that it was mostly mostly made up, but I was inspired by it. Many people were inspired beyond that, and they said, well, I, I need to go down and find my own shaman, you know, and, and it's like people used to make pilgrimages to India to find their guru. Well, then they started making pilgrimage to South America or Mexico to find their their shaman, you know, and the, this sort of romantic notion, which, you know, in some ways is admirable. I mean, it's fine that they wanted to go out on that quest, but then the popularity grew and and the way that we saturate the information space it pretty it very quickly became unsustainable another another example here i think with uh, ayahuasca uh our friend dr lewis eduardo luna who uh will be at the conference and who uh mark and i both know well uh he uh is probably the world's authority on the ethnography of ayahuasca. But he published, together with the uh, Peruvian visionary painter Pablo Amaringo, he published a book in the early 90s called uh, Ayahuasca Visions, the, the Religious Iconography of a Peruvian Shaman. And uh, it was a coffee table book, literally, with these beautiful paintings of Pablo's visions and then Eduardo's explanation in English on the facing page of the significance of each one of these patient, paintings. And the book was basically, in some ways, it was a collection of paintings, but was also kind of a crash course in uh, vegetalismo, which is what it was called, that tradition, <clears throat> excuse me, that mestizo tradition. Well, the book came out in the early 90s, and it was on many coffee tables. And I really think it was a, a big influence in, in initiating the ayahuasca tourism phenomenon, you know, for better or worse. Many people were curious and in the age when you can just get on a jet and go down there and suddenly you're immersed in this. Many people took up the gauntlet and they did that with the... Uh, you know, 
multi, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a many and source. Some of this is a good thing. It's good that people go seeking uh, enlightenment from, from plant medicine and plant teachers. But on the other hand, you have to think about the pressure on these cultures and the pressure on their genetic resources, these plants. Now ayahuasca and, uh, uh, and iboga, peyote particularly, is, uh, you know, they're endangered species, essentially, because people love them too much. That's what our friends from ICERS are going to talk about. And so the community, the psychedelic community, to the degree that there is one, needs to also be mindful of the unintended consequences when global global society interfaces with these rather fragile indigenous societies. Well, you Dennis, know, I heard you. you know, they end up on the short end of a stick, you know. I heard you on a panel recently where you said the problem was we're loving these plants to death. Yes, I, that, literally, that's, that's right. It's the same thing, but I, I want to... I have another the, question here from the from the well, comments. If we have, and we're running a little low on time, um, is that all right? Can I jump in here? Another the question, then I have a follow up for Dennis. No, that sounds great. Thank you so much, both um, Dr. McKenna and Dr. Plotkin. So we have some, and this kind of goes along with one of my questions. So I thought it'd work out nicely. Um, but we have one from Holly Reagan, and she says that her experience in Peru with some shamans emphasize the importance of ayahuasca specifically being used in a context with other plant remedies. Um, and so she goes on to say a couple of other things, but I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit about your early work on ayahuasca admixtures, um, or if both either you, Dr. McKenna or Dr. Plot can have anything to say about admixtures. Dennis first. Well, yes. I mean, uh, I, I haven't really worked on that many admixtures when I worked when I did my graduate work on ayahuasca it wasn't really on my radar I knew there were other plants associated with it but I didn't focus on that you know I focused on the two main plants Banisteriopsis and Chacruna the DMT containing admixture plant but yeah in the traditional context the admixture plants which are used in the dietas, you know, which is very much emphasized in traditional uh, ayahuasca, uh, you know, the mestizo tradition, are considered teacher plants, and you diet with them. Sometimes you mix them with ayahuasca. Other times, more uh, more commonly, you you work with them in a state of isolation where you take ayahuasca. But the ayahuasca helps you learn how to use these plants. So the the concept of plants as teachers, and Eduardo Luna has written about this, plants that teach is kind of the the worldview of particularly, uh, you know, vegetal as well as it's practiced in Peru. And the admixtures, again, represent a, an area that from the standpoint of chemistry and pharmacology is really un, unexplored pretty much. There's a lot to be discovered there. We know maybe 50 genera of plants that are used as admixtures, maybe as many as 100. So you've got ayahuasca, the two core plants that go into ayahuasca. But then you have this whole less well-defined galaxy of this pharmacopoeia of other plants that is kind of you know, around these central plants. And there's a lot of ethnopharmacologic drug discovery to be done there. I think there's, you know, a number of PhDs waiting to be done if investigators want to do it, if there's funds to do it and so on. There's new stuff to be to be discovered there. Well, I, I want to jump in on that because in my most recent book, The Amazon, What Everyone Needs to Know, I tallied up. There's over 100 different plants in Amazonia used as ayahuasca admixtures. Mm -hmm. Beginning to understand the synergy between them, uh, and not just ayahuasca, but other things like curare. And this is just a deep, deep well. Uh, we could spend hours on, on that alone. 
But I want to jump to something else, which touches on what Dennis said earlier. But before we do that, because I know that a lot of people have joined us since we started, I want to ask everybody to put in the chat box where they're dialing in from. It's useful and interesting for us. And the, the, the question that I want to address, Dennis, going back to uh, this idea of idea gens and mind altering substances, psychedelics as helping create creativity and new ideas. Uh, Dennis and his late brother Terence are famous, among other things, for the so-called uh, uh, stoned ape theory that mushrooms created humans in terms of cranial capacity and new ideas and language and things like that. But there's an alternative theory, which is the drunken monkey theory of <laughs> just coming down from the trees and eating the ripest fruits, which are not fermented and were alcoholic and got them drunk. So Dennis was human origin because of drunk monkeys or stone monkeys? Well, Mark, maybe they were drunk and stone monkeys. You know? <laughs> I mean, the point is uh, really that, uh, that uh, you know, any of these psychoactive drugs, you know, they let you step out of your reference frame and uh, for a while. I think psychedelics let you do it in a more rewarding way, whereas you know, just getting uh, blotto, just getting shit faced on alcohol, will demolish your debt reference frame, but it won't put much much in its place. That's interesting. And when you do it with psychedelics, you get, I think, more reward because you you get access to these inner worlds, basically, and these worlds of ideation and and language and poetry. I, I'm a believer that it's like that mushrooms, particularly probably were an inspiration, probably were a critical, uh, uh, you know, triggering factor in the origin of language and the association between inter, you know, the ability to construct an internal world that's meaningful, the meaningful image related to, you know, language and the ability to, you know, that the process internally is called synesthesia and synesthesia is very much about the association of meaningful sounds meaningful images with with also with sounds and and that's really the basis of language i'm not explaining that very well but but language and cognition the ability to internalize a reality you know which is what we do we don't live in reality as such we live in an artificial reality that's the that's that's filtered through our senses and processed by you know internally and we can construct a model of reality that we live in what what the neuroscientists are now calling the uh, default mode network but what i like my own my own term for it before they were talking about this was the reality hallucination and we all inhabit the reality hallucination and no the huxley talked about this in terms of the reducing valve a lot about what the brain does it's not so much receiving information it selectively blocks a great deal of information that never makes it through and it takes what gets through and it molds it into a model of reality that makes sense otherwise it would just be a blooming buzzing confusion and you wouldn't know what was going on but then it's useful once in a while to disable that default mode network or to disable that reality hallucination just blow it open step outside the reference frame and you learn from that i really think that that's at the basis of the therapeutic uh you know efficacy of a lot of these psychedelics they let you step out of your usual default reference frame look at your situation whether it be depression or trauma or addiction whatever you know terms you want to put on it look at it in a different way and that's how you can understand how to how to come to terms with it well i want to jump in here with an analogy dennis this reality hallucination i think the, the relevant analogy here for everybody out there in listener land is that's kind of what we're trying to do here okay this is not the last word we don't have all the answers 
We've had right. the advantage, the honor, and the privilege of working with peasant peoples, indigenous peoples for decades. And the point of this session and the point of the, po uh, the Plants of the Gods podcast and the point of ESPD 55, as I understand it, is to give people a taste of the importance of this wisdom, of the power of this wisdom, and that it's all highly endangered for all the obvious reasons. So that you have to understand we're trying to do here is give you a taste of this and bring a broader appreciation. I mean, here we are with the world totally interested in hallucinogens for Western therapy, but you and I have devoted our life to try and helping the people that have provided us with this at the same time that academia is closing down the few ethnobotany programs because they don't understand the relevance. So we're burning the candle at both ends. But the point here is to bring this information to a broader audience and get them more interested and understand this isn't some sort of colonial ripoff where we go down there and collect a few plants and get rich doing this stuff, but to create the basis and the willingness and the power and, and the movement towards a world where these people, this knowledge, these plants, these fungi, these frogs are honored, appreciated, and protected much better than is being done now. Antonio, you have a question. No, yeah. thank you, Mark. That was very well said. And thank you, Dr. Very McKenna. Um, no, I'm Antonio again. I'm with the Amazon Conservation Team and with Plants of the Gods. And one question that I have for you, Dr. McKenna, is that we are going to have or there's going to be a screening of or a pre-release screening of the upcoming documentary by the McKenna Academy, um, Bio Biognosis. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about this project and kind of what um, what we should expect? Yes, yes. Well, uh, right, biognosis. So two words put together, bio, which is life, and gnosis, which is knowledge. And our, that project exactly embodies what Mark is talking about. The subtitle is Bridges to Ancestral Wisdom. And what we're trying to do is with this this series this documentary series is kind of take a snapshot of the current state of traditional medicine in the amazon how it's being practiced now in the 21st century post covid post ayahuasca tourism post climate change post globalization all of these factors that impact on traditional medicine practices in the amazon which yet remains vital to the people and essential to the people. Most people still get, believe it or not, I think globally, Mark can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think 80% of the world's population relies on traditional medicine for their basic medical need. They can't afford to go to pharmacists. There are no pharmacies, a lot of places. They can't afford to, nor would they necessarily even choose that if the option was available because they have their own ethnomedical practices, which in many cases are quite efficacious, you know, for what they do. And so this documentary series we hope to do, Biognosis, is to bring that home to people, to, to give people a, a look at how this is on a daily basis for the people that live this every day. And we hope to do a series that focuses on different aspects of the of this ongoing still very active tradition and then in the longer term the next uh, uh, phase of that is we want to uh, work with the uh, uh, university in Iquitos, UNAP, the Universidad Nacional Amazonia Peruana. They have an herbarium there. This is Juan Ruiz showing he's the curator of the herbarium and a friend of mine, and probably Mark's as well, I've worked with him for 40 years, you know, and he is now, you know, the herbarium is a gem. A herbaria, herbaria, most people know, not everybody knows, herbarium is a library of plant specimens, just like a library of books. And, a, and there's 100,000 specimens in this herbarium in Iquitos. Only 50,000 of them are actually mounted and labeled and in the collection. The other 50,000 have never been taken out of the bags they were collected in because there's no resources to do that. There's, you know, you need armies of graduate students to unpack these specimens and properly label them and all that. So in a longer term, we're hoping to get sufficient funds 
to actually digitize this herbarium, get all these specimens mounted, get them online in a way that's accessible to people and in, in an interactive way. And that bridges traditional knowledge and scientific knowledge. And then if we can go to the next step, but I don't know whether this is fantasy, it's certainly possible, but we want to create what we're calling the visionary rainforest. We want to take this data and effectively make a VR representation of it. So that if you, if you can't go to the Amazon, you can visit the visionary rainforest from the comfort of your, of your studio, you know, and you can go through and the collections from the herbarium would be scattered through this virtual immersive space. And it would be linked to traditional knowledge and current scientific knowledge and, and whatever. And that that's going to be a long term project. But, it, but it, it's a way to take this, you know, sort of run down herbarium underfunded, underappreciated under, you know, just just under resourced in every way bring some serious uh, support to it and turn it into a gem and an example of, you know, document the, the biodiversity in this region and, and use that as an example. This could be done in, this could be replicated in many, many other parts of the world, you know, in collaboration with botanical gardens and, and that sort let of me, thing. Let me jump in here and, and, and add to what Dennis is saying. Uh, when worlds collide in a good way, I was in a Zoom meeting uh, by the, the Kennedy School at Harvard recently. They're talking about climate change in the Amazon. You had some of the brightest people in the world saying, we've got to plant this tree. It's a great hydrator. It captures carbon, on and on and on and on. And I'm asking, what tree is? It turns out it's Varola. <laughs> which is immediately enough, right? Northern Amazon. And I, I'm like, guys, if you think this tree is special because it's good for carbon, I got something else to tell you. But this <laughs> effort that Dennis is talking about, where we're trying to bring this indigenous wisdom together with Western wisdom to complement it so everybody benefits. You know, uh, uh, Liniana Madrigal, the co founder of ACT, my partner, says that ethnobotanists have to be Trojan horses in a good way that we can bring these people to these venues and have them speak for themselves. When we went to the headquarters of Google a couple of years ago, I got up and gave an intro and turned the stage over to the head of the Kogis, the lead chairman and the, and the head of the a political organization. And that's how we can empower these people and amplify their voices through projects like these so that the world is hearing the lessons they have to teach us. Antonio, you have a question as we start to wind up here? No, that, thank you both. That was it was really wonderful, um, Dr. McKenna and Mark. Thank the you. Very important point that Mark made, though, is, is essentially that we're we are Trojan horses. I think uh, you know we uh, at least I know Mark and I and a lot of people in this field. So you know we're white men. We're not indigenous. You know we need more women in the field. We need more indigenous people. But just because we're doing this doesn't mean we don't you know, respect the indigenous people and we want them to have an active role and for their contributions to be recognized. We're not trying to be uh, paternalistic about this or anything or colonialistic. We want them to be uh, equals in this partnership. Yeah, no, I want to absolutely. Two notes from, from my side. Uh, ethnobotany lost a giant last month, a gentleman by the name of Peter Gorman, yes. uh, a raconteur, an explorer, the, the fellow who really brought the magic frog to the outside world, wrote a wonderful book called Ayahuasca in My Blood. So without asking Dennis, I'm sure he agrees with me, we would like to dedicate this session to the memory of Peter Gorman, uh, a wonderful champion of the Amazon. And yes, I, I, I totally of agree. Peter was one he of the 30, 40 years, and I still don't get tired of listening to his insights. And his right. So there's more to tell. And I encourage everybody to check out ESPD50 in a couple of weeks, ESPD55.com on the internet. Plants of the Gods is coming up with a new season, uh, launching at the second week of May. So I want you to tune in for that. And I want everybody to stay tuned, look at our back catalog of Facebook Live on similar topics. We will do an interview with Dr. Dennis McKenna uh, later this season, if not next.
but there's more you learn in ethnobotany, the less you realize you know, and the more there is to learn. It's disappearing fast, and all of us are dedicating our lives to protecting that biocultural diversity, not only for the benefit of ourselves, but more importantly, for the benefit of the forests and the peoples who live there, because yeah. as the shamans say, it's all- I, I think it's important to remember, you know, we are all indigenous to earth, you know, and if we could get past our divisions and think of ourselves as earthlings, you know, we might evolve into a better place because we all have to live on this spaceship and it's, you know, it's under stress. So first thing we have to do is recognize it's earthlings, you know, it, we're earthlings, that's all. You're here. Well, thank you for that, Dr. McKenna. Thank you for that for Antonio. Uh, thank you that for Derby Mitchell Associates for putting this together. Uh, thanks to the Plants of the Gods and the Amazon Conservation Team for making this session and future sessions possible. Check us out on the web, amazonteam.org. Check out ESPD55.com. Sign up now before you forget. Check out Plants of the Gods, available uh, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and wherever your podcasts are found. So thank yeah. you, everyone. We look forward to continuing the conversation. Stay tuned. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so and much. Dr. McKenna, is there anything that you can tell us that we should know about registering for ESPD? Sure. Go to ESPD55.com and the button will be right up there. Attend. Click the attend button and register and you're good to go. Perfect. That sounds easy enough. Yeah. No, that's fine. No, thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mark. See you in the UK. <laughs> so in a couple of weeks, Dennis, in person for a change. Yes. Thanks for everyone dialing in. We look forward to the next session already. Okay. Very good. Out, everyone. All Over right. and out. All right.